Hello, I'm Curtis Hartshorn and this is a class on reaching new levels of faith. We're up to class number 14 where we're going to talk about how do I reach mature faith. I want to encourage you to get out your student workbook and open it up to chapter 14 and more importantly grab that Bible and if you look in your workbook, you're going to see that we are on chapter 14 and the first scripture we're going to look at is Hebrews chapter 5. So if you've got your workbook open and you've got your Bible open to Hebrews 5, then you're ahead of the game. You know, I've been in sports all my life and I've, I played high school and collegiate sports and it doesn't matter what sport it is, football, baseball, basketball, golf, right now I'm into disc golf. There is always a need to finish strong. And that's what I'm going to do with this class. These last three classes, I want to promise to you that I'm going to give God my absolute best as a teacher. I'm going to ask you as a student to do the same. Let's use these last three classes to really finish strong, to get as much as we possibly can in our knowledge of how to grow in our faith, but not just that, to actually grow in our faith as much as we can in these next three courses. In the last class, I talked to you about can I reach mature faith? And I put that class in there because a lot of people think this is impossible. You know, it's just lofty, unattainable goal. I will never have mature faith. You know, I have met many people with mature faith, modern day people with mature faith in the kingdom. And I've really been blessed to get a chance to sit down and talk with many of them about how their faith grew. And I found a pattern Several of them were telling me the same things over and over again, seven basic things really about how they grew in their faith. It didn't surprise me at all to find those same seven things in the Bible. We're going to look at six passages actually to find seven steps toward having mature faith. And the reason there's, there's seven is we're going to find two in the very first passage. So seven things that you could do right now that are going to help you to have mature faith. If you've already figured out that maybe you started with imitating faith or affiliating faith, and you've gone out and you've searched out your faith, and you've been through the struggles of searching faith that we've already learned about, and you've hit that point where you searched and searched, but you reached that point where you said, I need to solidify, I need to make my faith solid. If you've gone through that step, how do I reach mature faith. What's the next step? Well, there's seven things that you need to do. The first one is be a teacher of God's Word as you ought to be. Now, why do you say, why do I say that you ought to be that way? Because that's what Hebrews chapter 5 says. Hebrews 5 verse 11 says, concerning him, we have much to say and it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. Interesting phrase there, dull of hearing. If you glance across the page there, chapter 6, verse 12, you'll see so that you will not be sluggish, or some translations say lazy. That's exactly the same Greek word that's used in chapter 5, verse 11 for dull of hearing. So it's, it's laziness of hearing. Lazy as opposed to diligence in chapter 6, verse 11. We're sluggish. We're lazy of hearing. Sometimes we're just being lazy. Verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. If you're going to have mature faith, you need to understand that you need to become a teacher of God's Word. Now, every time that we have a Bible class like this or we hear a sermon, we should be absorbing this knowledge so we can turn around and teach it to other people. This isn't just for your benefit. This is so you can learn to benefit others as well. Our, every church that we have is a teacher training institution. That's what we do. Every man, woman, and child in the church should be training to be a teacher. Now, when we hear the word teacher, we think stand in front of a big group of people and teach. And 
yes, that is teaching. But teaching is more than just talking to a, a big group of people. You may not be gifted at speaking to a large audience, but everyone can teach someone. You can learn something, and then th as you're learning this, you should be thinking, well, who could I help to grow in their faith? And think about how you're going to turn around and teach that other person. And that is a step to grow in your faith. In fact, if you want to have mature faith, every person that I've talked to has mature faith. This is what they do. In some way, they teach others about the Word of God. Now, the second step that you take is also in the same passage. And number two in your workbook is train yourself to discern between good and evil. That's verse 14. But solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. If you're going to be mature in your faith, you have to have some discernment. You have to be able to tell this is right and this is wrong. This is good. This is evil. And every mature Christian that I've ever met uses the Bible as their basis for morality. This settles it. If it says it in the Word of God, if it says in the Bible, this is wrong, then it's wrong. If it says in the Bible, this is right, this is right. Undisputed. You need to train yourself. If you want to have mature faith, you need to be able to train yourself to discern the difference between good and evil. Now, number three. If you still have love for this world at this point in your faith development, it's time to refocus your life. It's time to lose that. Let's turn to the book of 1 John chapter 2. And read with me, please, in verse 15. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but it is from the world. The world is passing away and also its lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. The Bible says we're not to love the world. Now that doesn't mean that we can't enjoy creation and and see the beauty of the mountains and the rivers and the hills and all that stuff. Uh, in fact, uh, I was thinking about this uh, just this week that, you know, Jesus was the consummate outdoorsman. He was constantly outdoors. All day long, he's outdoors. He, he ate outdoors. He talked to people outdoors. He slept outdoors most of the time. Rarely was he indoors. So there's nothing wrong with loving the world in the sense that appreciate the beauty around us. But when we get too attached to this world, when we're way, way too comfortable here, in other words, we're not really looking forward to the next world. We're, we're not seeing the spiritual world that's around us. We're too focused on the physical. There's no way we can have mature faith if we're caught up in this material world. We have to turn loose that way. And that means you have to be honest with yourself about whether you have this priority problem. Are you too attached to the things of this world? Are you too attached to money? You know, money is not a, a sin. It's the loving of it that is a sin, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10. Think about people in the Bible that Jesus talked to. Think about the rich young man in Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 23. Remember that man who came to Jesus and says, What must I do to inherit eternal life? He said he had kept all the commandments. He says, what do I still lack? And Jesus says, go sell all your possessions and give them to the poor. Why did Jesus ask him to do that? Because his priorities were wrong. He knew money was something he was way too attached to. And it wasn't just because he was rich. Because Zacchaeus, Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 9, there was another rich man. He was a tax collector. But his attitude was, he says, right now, I'll offer up all that I've done. I'll give half of my possessions to the poor. And rather than telling that man, go sell everything and give it to the poor, Jesus said, salvation has already come to this house. It's not, it's not just money that's a sin. It's loving it. It's when we're too attached to it. So if you still have this love for the world, if you're still attached to the world, you need to reevaluate 
your priorities. You may need to learn, turn loose of some things so that you can go on and have that mature faith that God wants you to have. Fourthly, fourth step that you can take towards mature faith is put childish ways behind you. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, if you'll join me there, I'll explain what I mean by childish ways. Paul's been talking about love. And then he goes on to say in verse 9, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly and then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully just as I also have been fully known. Paul says, when I was a little boy, when I was just a kid, I thought like a kid, I reasoned like a kid, I talked like a kid, I did childish things. But when I became mature, when I became a man, I had to put the childish things away. If you're going to mature in your faith, you've got to grow up. You've got to do away with childish things. If you're wondering, well, what kind of things are we talking about here? We're talking about pouting. We're talking about complaining when things don't go our way. Childish things. Christians who have mature faith, they don't pout. They don't gripe. They don't complain. They don't act childish. They're mature. Mature faith it has this, uh, this quality. It's just not childish. Now, at the same time, number five, and this is going to sound like, almost like I'm contradicting here, but uh, I'm going to show you two passages that show both sides of this coin. Number five, at the same time, your faith needs childlike qualities. Interesting, in Matthew chapter 18, when uh, the apostles were, you know, they were always arguing about who was the greatest in the kingdom. Well, there was an occasion where they actually presented this question to Jesus. It's in Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They are wanting to know who is the most mature, who is the strongest among us. Verse 2 says, And he called a child to himself and set him before them and said, Truly I say to you, Unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Forever then humbles himself as this child. He is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So while being mature in our faith means we need to put childish ways behind us, there's still something about children that we can learn from that can help us to be strong in our faith. They want to know who's the greatest, Jesus. And he, he calls a little child, says, come up here. Says, you see this child? You need to be like this child. Now he doesn't mean we need to be childish in the sense that we, we pout and, and we, we, uh, we whine and, and things like that. But there's a quality about children that we need to have. Let me illustrate this quality in a very unusual way. I'm going to put up here on the screen a story that you may be very well familiar with. It's from Dr. Seuss, Green Eggs and Ham. I want to read this to you and you can follow along with me. It says, I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam I am. I could not, would not on a boat. I will not, will not with a goat. I will not eat them in the rain, not in the dark, not in a tree, not in a car. You let me be. I do not like them in a box. I do not like them with a fox. I will not eat them in a house. I do not like them with a mouse. I do not like them here or there. I do not like them anywhere. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam I am. 
Now, if you are near a child right now, you probably saw that child perk their ears up. Really enjoy that story. Dr. Seuss has such a, an amazing gift of reaching children. But as adults, we can somewhat enjoy that. We can enjoy the, the rhythm and the rhyme to the story. But there's a part of us as adults that prevents us from getting the most out of that story. And here's really the difference between adults and children when it comes to things like this. Children implicitly trust the storyteller. In other words, children can listen to Green Eggs and Ham and they can say, oh, wow, that is so cool. This is this, and this. And, but we as adults, we're like, Green Eggs and Ham? What's that all about? And, and why would I want to eat it with a fox? And I, I'm not getting all this. Our, our maturity, supposedly, or our, our overthinking things does not allow us to accept the message. Children implicitly trust the storyteller. The childlike quality that Christ really wants us to have is we need to mature to the point, grow in the point to our faith where we implicitly trust the wisdom of our Heavenly Father. That's the childlike quality that He wants us to have. Where when we read it in the Bible, we say, I don't care if I understand it or not. This is true. This is right because I trust the storyteller. I trust the author of this book, God Almighty. That's maturity. When you can get to that point where you have that childlike quality in your life, where you implicitly trust the storyteller. Those are five things you can do that will help you to mature your faith. Let me give it to you more. Number six, forget the past and press on. This is a tough one. It was really tough for Paul. And that's why in Philippians chapter 3, if you'll turn with me there, Paul gives us an insight to how he reached mature faith. You think about Paul's past and all that he had to forget and forgive himself for. It was so hard. But here's what he says. Philippians chapter 3, in his own words, as he's writing to the church in Philippi, he says in verse 12, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching toward what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if anything, you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. I shared with you in the last class that the Greek word teleos which is translated mature, can also be translated perfect. And that word is used here in verse 12 and also in verse 14. He says, in his mind, he didn't think that he had achieved perfection. He says, but I, I'm striving toward it. And here's what I'm doing. I'm pressing on. I'm forgetting what lies behind, and I'm pressing on towards what is ahead of me. There's a strong chance that if you don't have mature faith, the thing that's holding you back is something from your past, something that you just won't let go of. You won't forgive yourself for, something that you did maybe. It doesn't do any good to beat yourself up and to hold on to that. You're never going to be the man, never going to be the woman that God has called you to be if you don't learn how to forget the past and move forward. Paul ordered Christians to their death. He had to, to preach to congregations where there might be orphans right here on the, on the front pew. And they're orphans because he'd ordered their parents to be killed. You think he didn't have some tough things to overcome in his life? I know you, you have tough things, and I'm not trying to make light of those, but you've got to let go. 
You've got to reach that point where you can forget what was behind and press on, reach, strive for that new level of faith that God wants you to have. Forget the past and press on. The seventh and final and probably the most important thing that you could do if you really want, want to reach mature faith is make winning as many as possible your lifestyle. Now this is also Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul shares his insights. Paul was one of the greatest evangelists of our time. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he says this in verse 19. For though I am free of all men, I have made myself a slave to all so that I may win more. To the Jews, I became as a Jew so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without the law, as without the law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that I may by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel, so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. Every mature Christian that I know, every modern mature Christian that I've talked to, makes winning as many as possible a lifestyle. And I don't I don't mean just something that they say they got to do. It's like, oh, I'm supposed to be evangelistic. Uh, I think I can squeeze that in Saturday. No, it's their lifestyle. It's what they do. They have incorporated that into whom they are. And it would surprise you, <laughs> these people in mature faith, that they're, they're not dynamic people. They're just people who are dead serious about their faith, and they've figured out they need to win as many as possible. That's what Paul is saying. I, I adapt. I, I find ways. I don't accept the excuses. I don't say, oh, well, people are just not open here. Or, you know, it's just because of, of COVID or this or that. I, I can't do this. No, they find a way to make it work. Mature Christians find ways to lead others to Christ. Do you want to have mature faith? Make winning as many as possible your lifestyle. There they are. There's seven ways, seven things that you can do that will help you to have mature faith. Let's finish strong, class. Let's, let's take this all the way. We've only got two more lessons. In my next lesson, I want to talk to you about how does Satan attack our faith? Satan has a plan. He has a way that he is trying to get to us. And I want to talk about some of his strategies and how to prepare for his onslaughts so that we can stand strong in our faith against his wiles. Thank you for being here. We'll see you in the next class.